Welcome dudes to an authentic Nashville recording studio where I'm going to show you a day in the life of a session drum. Hey man, actually uh, we typed in the drum part and it sounds great so you're, you're good to go. Hello dudes and welcome to the ruckus room where many hit records have been made such as Shake It Girl, Girl Shake It Girl, It Shake It Shake Girl, The Greatest Hits of Taylor Swift, and Shake It Girl Spotify Exclusive Acoustic Reprise. My session musician compadres and I spend many hours of our lives in buildings like these and yet what we do in here remains such a secret to the outside world. So as a gesture of encouragement to those who may want to play on records one day and as an homage to those who have paved the way making records before us, this is Dude, inside a Nashville studio set, studio session. We can Pro Tools that, right? Bum, 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 bum. Our story begins with a phone call. In my experience, it's not often that the top 100 session drummers who are actually qualified to do this work are all busy on the same day at the same time. So I gotta be ready when this call hits, regardless of the circumstances. The most common call I get is for what's known as a five in three, meaning the session is three hours long and we're gonna cut five songs in that period of time. And on the vast majority of these occasions, we're creating demos, meaning the public will never hear what we're doing. Rather, we're just taking songwriter work tapes and creating these fully orchestrated recordings of them, which then get traded around behind the scenes like baseball cards until a major artist comes along and decides to pick that song for his or her own commercial release, at which point master session musicians just take what we did and do it better in their own five and threes. But enough backstory, let me walk you through the session. It's May 31, 2 p.m. I roll in right on time, because here in Nashville we have a fancy service called Cartage setting up my drums for me. Because waking up any earlier than 1.30 p.m. just to tune my own drums, it'd be an insult to the craft. Dude, did Cartage bring my stuff? You don't have Cartage. Damn it, Mom! Hang on, I gotta go home. All right, that was a bluff. I don't have Cartage, but I'm buddies with a guy who does because he books multiple sessions per week. No, you're not. Nah. But you can imagine what it'd be like if I did. All right, so scratch that. May 31 rolls around. I don't have cartage, so I roll in around 1 p.m. for my 2 o'clock session if the studio's open, so I'm way up and running before the downbeat. And generally speaking, I've learned to just go ahead and bring everything I can fit in my car, because anytime I leave that fourth overly specialized ride cymbal at home, I get a... Hey, man, do you have any uh, ride cymbal options other than the three you've already tried on this one? So once I'm up and running and the engineers have expressed sufficient upsetness with me for setting up all queer and lefty-like, it's time for me to get sounds, which for the first 27 years of my life I thought meant impress everyone around me with my completely sick drum player chops. Hey, um, yeah, Tom 2 only, please. The sweet spot I've found with getting sounds is to play simply and consistently. And you know what I've learned the hard way a lot? Three hours is a long time to play drums with focus and intent, so try not to burn thousands of calories while the engineers dial a bunch of racks in on like the 20 mics that might be pointed at you. The last thing I'll say about getting sounds is it's not uncommon for an engineer or a producer to tell me they want me to change the sounds on my end. My approach to this in general is to bring drums in that are pretty live, and when I'm told to deaden something up, 100 times out of 100 I put total trust in that engineer and just start taking heads. Alright dudes, the sounds are dialed in, so now we all meet in the control room to listen to whatever we're working on. This is often the first and only time any of us are hearing this material, so it's important that we each listen intently, especially the session leader who gets paid double to write us a chart. After one listen through, the assistant engineer will then use his four years of college plus two years of unpaid engineering internship to make copies of the chart. And you know what, bring five copies too. And hurry up, damn it! This downtime is your first true opportunity to banter, which is an important part of bonding with your fellow musicians here in the submarine. You want to make sure you're up on your ex-wife material, tube pedals, and how one day you're gonna make your own record. So I have an announcement. I'm starting my own solo record. Yeah. Good, job. yeah it's good for you, man. Um. Anyway, charts in hand, we take our places for the first pass of the first tune. The goal is to get something coherent down from front to back. It's not like everything rides on this one take, but I do genuinely want to approach it with the mindset that most of this take is going to be a keeper. So the three rules of thumb I try to keep in mind for myself in this first pass are one, do not be the reason the train stops. Play something to get us through to the end and we can refine from there. And two, if I make a mistake or a bad part choice, just stick a mental flag in that part of the form and let it go so I can get back to making the best music I can make right now. All right, first pass. I'm a million miles away, always daydreaming. The roots I didn't mean to break. I can't shake the feeling. Oh, yeah, number three is that.
that the true meta game begins after the final note of the song. It is considered honorable to be the first to interpolate an obscure, unrelated musical theme at the soonest possible moment after you feel the track will be cut off from the fade of the last chord. actually made it to the end of the first take, but we're not done. So this is where we start punching. You're basically looking at two scenarios here. One is that the producer might have feedback on what you played and what he or she might want you to do differently. And if you have one job as a session musician, it is to always obey the producer. We actually captured footage of this, so let me show you what I mean. And if we can get that kick to feel a little bit more orange, that'd be awesome. Sure thing, dude. Thanks. Dude's never played drums a day in his life, wants to tell me how to do my job. Give me a fucking break. Uh, your talkback's still on. Nope. Yeah, not really orange enough. Still not powdery enough either. Dude, that's just bad. Uh, yeah, sure, that'll work. Let's just move on. Now the other punching scenario is that, as you'll recall, I kept track of the sections I wasn't personally happy with, be it faulty part selection or just bad execution of the right part, so now's my chance to call out for those. And by the way, I used to think I was being polite by letting the alphas in the room ask for their punches first, but if I know I need a punch that's going to change the feel of a section, well I've learned to just go ahead and take those, or else I'm just wasting everybody else's punch time over rhythm tracks that aren't going to survive anyway. Dig? Cool guys, any fixes? Man, uh, let me just get the first chorus. I'll go with them. Uh, uh, yeah, me too. Uh, while we're doing it though, can I go and grab the um, intro, um, verse one, uh, first chorus, uh, the turn two, I did a little thing in the turn, I uh, didn't want really to work. Oh um, my god! Ah! Time is of the essence, so with the basic foundation work out of the way, anybody who can sweeten the track in any way is going to jump right back in together to stack or add new tracks. So guitar might have some aux parts to contribute, maybe piano guy switches over to B3 or Rhodes, and my default as a drummer is to sit up at the drums and play tambourine or shaker into the overheads. The key here is total concentration and groove. Harry, right, that was the end of the song. Oh. Traditionally, the guitar solos and lead vocals might require a few extra dedicated passes on their own. Hang on. Ooh, that's better. So at this point, we're theoretically done playing, but we still want to intensively listen back and make sure we're proud of what we laid down here. This is also your opportunity to obligatorily compliment the songwriter, you know, since he or she is the one paying you. I've definitely heard songs shittier than this one. Andrew? Andrew. He says he thinks it's going to be good when you put autotune on it. Autotune's already on it. Mm. Mm. And rinse and repeat. One song down, four more to go, and no pressure, but if you don't have at least two hours left on the clock, you're behind schedule. So it's important not to screw around. <laughs> That's it, my dudes. Now you've seen for yourself how the sausage is made. And now you might be thinking, really? That fast? Then how come records take two years to make? But it's actually the promotional photos. I guarantee promotional photos take longer here than recording does. Alright, I've said too much already. Thank you for watching, dudes. Happy sessioning.